welcome to A Thrivable Future, the podcast covering all things to do with sustainability, thrivability, and the important policy changes happening around the world. Hi, I'm Rebecca from The Thrive Project, the not-for-profit research and advocacy group. I'll be your host as we talk with our experts and special guests about all the thrivability matters affecting the world today. Before I introduce this week's guest, I'd like to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of this place now known as Australia. We respect the elders of the past and present, and we are grateful for the continuing care of the lands, waterways and skies where we listen, learn and thrive. This week, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Meghda Ramaswamy from the University of Saskatchewan. She is the director of the International Office for the University, where she leads a team of international research and partnership specialists to support international activities for faculty, staff and students. She is also deeply involved in promoting sustainable research and partnerships and is a passionate advocate for the UN Sustainable Development Goals. She's here today to talk with me about Sustainable Development Goal 17, which focuses on strengthening global partnerships to achieve sustainable development. Welcome, Meghna, and thank you for joining me. Thank you so much. It's it's a pleasure to be here. That's great. So, yeah, uh, tell me a little bit more about Sustainable Goal 17. What does that mean? A good question. So SDG 17, which is Partnerships for the Goals, is all about how can we work together, develop connections with other countries, governments, industry, uh, academics, and the communities to really bring benefit to the society that we live in. We know that the world is more interconnected than ever. And one thing that the COVID-19 pandemic has really taught us is that problems cannot be solved alone because the world is constantly changing. And I think, you know, uh, when we ask ourselves, you know, what is the kind of future that we want, we know that the challenges that we face need to have um, partnerships in order to solve them. So SDG 17, I would say, is one of the most important SDGs because achieving the other 16 goals depends on SDG 17. And so in order to reach these goals, we need to have these cross-sectoral, multi-stakeholder partnerships to really strengthen and streamline policies, improve access to technologies, have the right trade relations between different countries, ensure investment is made in the right initiatives. And you know, the other thing that SDG 17 does is it looks at how can we really aid the lower income countries. It makes sense to me that obviously we need to work together to achieve the goals. I mean, everything that humans have done in history has been from working together. But you also mentioned that a lot of the targets specifically, they focus on increasing support for the developing nations. Can you tell me why that specifically is important? Those kind of initiatives are important because I think, you know, when we think about what kind of sustainable production methods are used when it comes to farming and other areas, I think there is a lot that we can actually learn from the lower middle income countries. And I think they know how to navigate certain solutions. They have the solutions in place for certain challenges, which perhaps we do not have. And so really working with them, investing in their things can really bring that knowledge as well back to us. And I think this is something that we need to do more and more of. And plus, you know, the the world is finite when it comes to resources. So we do need to work together to address these kind of challenges, which may exist in their countries too. That's a really good perspective to bring to this, because I think a lot of people see it as sort of a one-way relationship where, you know, the richer countries are sending things to the less developed countries and not really getting anything out of that relationship necessarily. But your point about them having already figured out ways of of doing things that we don't necessarily know about is a really good one. I saw this video a little while ago and it was somewhere in Africa or maybe the Middle East somewhere. They basically took food and packed it into clay and, and sort of buried it. And it was like perfectly fresh when it came out. And it's like, wow, what a great way of doing things. It's not relying on refrigeration or any of the methods that we use that cause a lot of damage to the environment. And so, yeah, there's definitely a lot that we can learn. Absolutely. And I think, you know, they they face many unique situations that 
we sometimes may face due to climate change. But they mm-hmm. sort of, you know, they've, they've seen, you know, periods of drought. They know exactly what that is. And so when, when we face those situations in the Western world, sometimes not knowing how to cope with those situations, they already have things in place that they have developed over the years. And so those are the kind of things that we can really learn from them. And that's why I think it's a partnership of mutual benefit. And, you know, uh, both players, uh, you know, definitely would benefit from collaboration. I encounter people who will make claims that we should worry about our own backyard, worry about the people in our own countries and, you know, make sure that there's no homeless people or poverty in our own nations before extending overseas. At the university, which I work at, when we think about partnerships, we think about A, how is it sustainable? B, what value does it bring to the other partner? Because we can't just be thinking about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And when we're put into a situation of risk or something like that, are we both prepared to accept that ownership? and the responsibility of that partnership. So those are the kind of things that one takes into when you're looking at partnership development, you know, what is the value that each partner brings to the table? Uh, What are the associated risks in developing that partnership? What is the overall gains that we get beyond just our little niche area? You know, more and more people consider those things. And of course, there's that whole uh, equation of bringing in, you know, equity and uh, power balances and all of those things as well. Because, you know, you can't have one a partner which is very, very powerful, taking over the entire partnership and the other one feeling a lot neglected and left out. So I think, you know, when you think about partnership development, all of these factors come into play. Yeah, I mean, that was definitely something that struck me as a note of concern when there is a really big power imbalance in any kind of relationship, that that can negatively impact that partnership and prevent it from being a truly equal one that benefits both parties. Do you have a lot of methods for making balance points and and checks to to try and prevent one party from overriding the other? I think it's important that whenever you enter a partnership or you're looking to start a partnership, you need to see from their side what the world looks like and what are the challenges that this partner potentially is going to be facing entering into this partnership. And so one of the biggest things that always happens is resources, funding, funding. You know, that's always something that happens. The other bit that happens is, you know, some people may say your standards are a bit lower than what we used to. Those are the kind of issues that are usually brought up in a partnership. And then, you know, scaling up across geographies, things work in different timelines in different countries. You know, certain things which we may consider priorities may not be considered a priority by a partner in another country. So I think when you take an approach, you have to be mindful of this approach. You don't want to start your partnership on the wrong footing. And so I think, you know, having an open, transparent dialogue about all of these challenges right at the start of the partnership usually helps move that partnership go forward because it's all based on trust at the end of the day. I guess that you've got to like expect that there's some kind of level of good faith involved. Having a really good understanding of cultural backgrounds is probably going to be really helpful because there's going to be, I imagine, huge differences sometimes with, you know, values and things like that. So, And there's different ways in which different places operate. And what you might think might be the right way may not be the right way that they feel. Uh, and so, you know, all of those kind of things need to be taken into account. And, you know, some places are audited, some places are not audited. And, you know, you have all of these kind of things that we need to consider. And, you know, what are their local needs? What are our local needs? You know, where can we reach a compromise? How do we negotiate? What is the process of negotiation for a particular partner? Yeah. You know, some people want to have legal review. Others may not have a legal team in their structure. You know, there's lots of things like that, that I think, you know, um, when you enter a partnership, you really need to sort of focus, think about what you bring to the table. But I think overall, in my experience, you know, multi-stakeholder partnerships are not easy. They're very, very complex because there's so many parties involved and each one comes with a different opinion to the table. That is one of the challenging aspects of a multi-stakeholder partnerships. But I think the the benefits and the rewards that you get from us from such a partnership is worthwhile still pursuing. And I think, you know, uh, one of the advantages of a multi-stakeholder partnership is that it helps generate that much needed vision which is required for the future. I suppose that's really an environment where something like system thinking is really going to shine as well because you can look at the systems that each, you know, stakeholder is operating in. and Exactly. 
Yeah. And I think one of the key things about such partnerships is that a, you know, having a partnership with academia, working with industry, when you think about scalability, the basic applied research happens at universities and research centers. But for that scalability, you need to have links with the private industry to have changes in the way, you know, uh, policy decisions are made. You need to have the governments involved. You need to have municipalities in order to apply them to your local environment and your local cities so that the local community gets benefit. And yet you need to have the link with an international partner because they bring a unique perspective to the table. And there is a lot of knowledge which can be gained through those international partnerships. Uh, and like I said, you know, they faced unique challenges. And so bringing that, that intelligence and that knowledge to the local table can really increase our awareness and help educate all of us. So I think it's a win-win situation. And I suppose that really be viewed as a, a, a partnership as well. Like, you know, you don't get that culture of dependence that you see with things like, you know, charities and tourism. Like it's a very different kind of environment. Is there any issues with it being slower than other forms of change? Like when there's so many people involved, does that slow things down? It can take time to build that trust because you've got so many parties involved and navigating complex scenarios takes time. So yes, it is a time consuming thing to do. Sometimes it takes years. The more stakeholders, the longer it's going to take for a partnership to develop. And it's simply because, you know, different parties from different sectors bring in different interests and bring in different opinions and different ways of doing things. And so it's always going to be challenging to work around these partnerships. But I think, you know, uh, when you think about how these partnerships could be effective, that whole sharing of different perspectives and knowing the different ways in which things work really brings that extra dimension. Uh, and I think, you know, that's how we end up strengthening the partnership because they bring that dimension to this partnership. Now, I think, you know, the other thing that I was saying is that balancing that power struggle in a relationship is also challenging and can again take a bit of time, especially when there are multiple parties involved. And so bringing that partnership to be equitable is something else which takes time. And, you know, and so, you know, the end product seems f further away, but that's part and parcel of change. And so, you know, as we embark on such partnerships, um, we know that it's going to be time consuming. And I think in such partnerships, it's always good to be transparent right from the beginning so that the other party knows where they stand and where each one stands in that partnership. That does make sense. You know, you, if you're upfront and honest, you can get things done a lot quicker than if you're trying to you know, manipulate things or hold things back or anything like that. Now, I did have a question about target 17.4, which talks about coordinated policies to relieve debt, particularly external debt, to reduce debt distress in highly indebted poor countries. And I don't think I've ever said the word debt so much, but um, can you talk to me just a little bit about the context behind that target? Okay, so in these cases, I'm thinking about partnerships to provide aid for a start, to those very countries where we know they are in debt. So when we think about certain lower middle income countries, we really need to be thinking about how can we help people in those countries to create infrastructures and systems and increase trade with those countries so that we can actually help them become more financially and economically viable. For example, there's a lot there that we can actually acquire in terms of important export policies. So I think, you know, having that investment so that the aid that we provide can help those countries to improve those economies is extremely important. Secondly, by working with those countries in finance and trade, uh, I think the other thing that we end up doing is actually empowering individuals and organizations to have that right set of tools and knowledge so that they can achieve their financial goals. And I think, you know, just making sure that the work that we do helps alleviate natural disasters in this country so that they are not in debt when they have to face those disasters. Right. Um, and, and those sort of things, I think, are really, really important. So do you know, is debt a big problem in developing countries? Well, it's not just developing countries, to be uh, quite honest. I think, you know, when, when countries face war, there's a lot of debt. Just think about the Ukraine crisis right now. You know, that's a country that is requiring financing, 
they require infrastructure support, they need to rebuild. You know, this is a, a prime example of how countries can come together and work together to help Ukraine. And, you know, a lot of the institutions, when I think about huge organizations, governments, as well as even the post-secondary sector, are all working together to try and provide aid in terms of how can we support scholars in Ukraine to come to uh, Canada, for example, to, to practice research? How can we get their international students into Canada and waive their tuition fees? What can we do in our own organizations to help Ukrainian citizens? You know, it could be immigration. Uh, it could be providing them with support to set up businesses here. It could be with getting their students here so that they end up being, you know, scholars. Um, so I think there is a lot of assistance that uh, well-developed countries can provide to uh, lower middle-income countries, as well as countries that have faced uh, economic crisis through war. There are a lot of like external factors that can really like, because you, you're in need, so that puts you in debt. That makes sense to me. Absolutely. I just, yeah, well I wasn't well sure if it was like talking about like individual debt or if it's more of a, a national, you know. I think it's. I think it's more about a national debt because I think the SDGs, the way that they've been developed is that they are global goals at the end of the day, but they look at how countries and regions uh, can apply them in a way to their community. So, for example, when I'm thinking about the SDGs in a province that I live in, which is Saskatchewan, I think about, well, how can I make Saskatchewan more economically uh, prosperous? How can I provide uh, aid to ensure that the labor market needs are met? How can I ensure that we are having enough trade coming into Saskatchewan, whether it's you know, us exporting goods or us importing goods from other countries? So when I think about the SDGs, I think they apply to local settings, individual organizations, as well as yeah. to an individual. So I think it's looking at you know, the local connecting with the global. I can see how that helps, especially like for everyday people who are at home to sort of understand where they personally are fitting into the big picture because the SDGs are looking like they're very big picture goals. So I think it's hard to maybe connect them in a lot of ways with, you know, a lived reality. You know, you can go, uh, yeah, that, you know, I think problems just seem so big sometimes and being able to look at it as what can I do on an individual, a local level and how that interrelates into those bigger systems and changes things. I'm just going to throw an example. So if you think of an individual, you know, a family, a household with children that, you know, has some food wastage, you can think about how can I work with food banks? How can I donate the stuff that I buy, which is in excess to food banks? So again, those are the kind of partnerships that one can do at an individual level. How can I work my community organizations to increase their awareness of, you know, different international cultures? You know, how can I work with a Chinese organization? How can I work with, uh, you know, an indigenous organization so that I increase awareness and my, and my children learn more and more about it? So those are the kind of partnerships that at an individual level that you can work with your local community. Similarly, you know, one thing that we did at the university is that we had um, a lecture series for um, uh, people in the community. So this is the general public who were aged 55 years and over. And we had uh, a series of 17 SDG lectures, which we provided to the senior members of the community. And it was really well received. We had over 300 seniors learn about the SDGs, something that they've never heard of. But now that they know what the SDGs are about, they in their own little way, are able to contribute to it because they're the main voice in the community. And so they can really work with other seniors on gardening initiatives, on environmental initiatives, on education, on even making sure that traditional knowledge and cultural knowledge is there and passed on to their grandchildren. So, you know, there, there's lots that we can do at an individual level. Yeah, being able to reach people on their level and go, okay, this is, this is how you're connecting this is where you fit into this really big picture and you know these are the things that you can do and and change and just I, I suppose exposing them to that knowledge and to that broader perspectives I think really helps people you mentioned earlier about like investing in um, developing countries and how one of the things that they gain from it is knowledge of how to empower themselves what kind of things can can be done to sort of like encourage um, investors to look at developing 
countries. I think more and more, uh, we are finding that a lot of companies these days are having interest in supporting cooperative programs. So this is where a researcher at a university, for example, wants to set up a company in another country. And, you know, they they take a lot of guidance from uh, organizations. And so organizations are ending up, um, they end up working in those countries and finding that, you know, they're learning more and more about the environment in those countries through these researchers. The other way to do it is um, from an academic point of view, more and more funding calls are also asking for companies to be part of a research program and these might be international uh, funding calls, right? So, so I'm thinking about, um, for example, if you've got a funding call, say, you know, asking for three or four researchers to be part of this, a lot of them from lower middle income countries, they would also want two or three companies to be part of that research program so that you have the researcher working with that company and a researcher from another university, uh, another area of the world, also working with them on a particular research project. So that way they get to hear what's happening in a lower middle income country. They get more and more interested. They become more and more informed and aware and they end up working with them. The other thing that I think is worth mentioning is you also have something called the UN Global Compact. And that is basically, it's it's like all businesses that have incorporated sustainable development in their operations, in their financing, in their long-term goals for their business. And this is like a worldwide thing. And that really helps in the transfer of knowledge, as well as it helps bring people together to learn about what people in other regions are doing. So I think, you know, with all of these kind of initiatives, um, we are finding that there is so much appetite for um, the private industry to play a key role in increasing investments into lower middle, middle income countries. I suppose that the lower middle income countries are places where there's going to be more room for development opportunities as well. Yes. And if you think about Africa, you know, they have got a very young population. So if you look at the average age of their population, because it's so young, you're finding more and more companies are interested to invest in those places because they've got a very youthful population. And so yeah, they well, they've continue. naturally got that growth that, you know, that other growth and that whole professional have. development can happen within a single organization. So yeah. I think retention plays a big role. I also noticed that a lot of the targets of SDG 17 revolve around increasing the technology level. So what are some of the barriers that are involved in increasing the tech level of a developing country? No, no, technology is a huge barrier. And it's both, you know, um, a blessing and a curse in some ways, because, uh, you know, countries that have great infrastructures for technology really prosper. They really have figured out new ways of working together. However, you do have remote communities that are struggling and suffering because they don't have the right technologies for things to happen, like, you know, education online. We are finding that there are partnerships happening now between local communities, their municipalities, their local governments, and Wi-Fi providers. Because I think, you know, those are the kind of partnerships that can help alleviate this problem. So, you know, having that kind of partnership is going to be critical because if you think about the number of youngsters that don't have access to um, digital platforms in order to learn and educate themselves, it's going to create a huge problem in those communities if education is not accessible. And so partnerships with uh, Wi-Fi providers uh, with technological providers is going to be key moving forward. It's great that they've got, you know, younger populations and they've got all that growth, but if they don't have the infrastructure to help develop the skills that are being used in the more developed parts of the world, then they're not going to be able to, you know, engage with it. Like We need the government to play a key role because, again, developing those partnerships with these telecommunication providers, you know, costs money. And at the end of the day, we need the government to provide that support when it comes to financial investment into these partnerships so that these communication providers can then provide the right kind of technology required in remote rural communities or countries where there is very poor infrastructure. 
So this is why I think, you know, governments are pretty much the center of a lot of partnership developments when you're thinking mm -hmm. about things like, uh, you know, improving the digital divide that exists. And I think, you know, it's become more and more obvious with the whole COVID-19 pandemic as people have moved to digital platforms. And I think this is where, you know, securing those partnerships is going to be really, really important. I can see that having that government helping with the infrastructure and, and building that is going to be a huge thing. And recently in Australia, we've had a bit of a energy crisis um, with which that's happening worldwide the price of energy is increasing but where we we actually had an issue where our electricity grid is privatized and we put a market cap on it because the the prices basically were too expensive for regular people to be able to pay their electricity bills and that led to a lot of companies refusing to you know turn on the power basically because it wasn't going to be profitable the last couple of days we were facing the potential blackouts across you know the entire eastern seaboard essentially where you know like that it was it was a huge issue we actually had a, a first time like um step in and they were ordered to actually turn on even though it was not profitable like you know we're like no people need power kind of thing so you know yeah th there definitely can be an over-reliance, I think, on uh, a, a private industry to put in place and, and maintain infrastructure that maybe requires, I think, that federal level, you know, the, the government guidance and support, because otherwise, you know, when when stuff becomes not profitable. It's yeah, definitely huge issues, which, you know, so many countries are facing. And it's really interesting to see how different governments are actually dealing with these problems in different countries and regions. And I think, you know, that brings so much value in just knowing how different uh, countries are, are addressing those issues. Is Canada having issues with, the, you know, energy prices as well? Uh, yes, they are, because I did ask my plumber to come in one day to check something and he was basically saying, you know, we don't accept credit card or debit card, just pay us fuel tokens. And, oh, wow. And <laughs> I'm just kidding, but I think okay. <laughs> much, because the prices have really rocketed for, for fuel. If there is a, a fuel crisis in one country, accessing that means the demand goes up in producing fuel in another country, and so prices go up. And the international relations, obviously, with Russia invading Ukraine and so forth, so it's cutting ourselves off a, a lot from that supply it's accessibility at the end of the day, right? Yeah, so, yeah. you know, each country uh, has a portfolio of what they export. And we sometimes put all our eggs in one basket and rely on one provider. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then when something comes as a crisis in that country, the person who's been reliant on them for fuel or whatever ends up suffering because there's just not enough to go around now. And so you then look at other countries that can provide it but the other countries can then increase their prices and then you know mm -hmm. it affects each and every one of us Let yeah and I, I suppose it does show the real importance of having that like inbuilt resilience you know diversifying what investors will yeah. tell you to do is diversify and not rely and, on and just one thing because exactly or having enough within your own country to produce things if we had invested more in renewables and things like that then we wouldn't be struggling as much because we'd have that additional support exactly yeah you know geopolitics uh, always has a part to play when you think about international relations that's what it's all about is how do you navigate those complex relationships and i think that that's part of the importance of having these conversations as well as what people see at home is like my bill's gone up or there's a blackout or you know things like that like that's the problem that they're facing and they don't necessarily understand all of the different factors that are impacting it yeah things that happen at a governmental level much higher up i think uh, does trickle down and uh, at the end of the day you know we as taxpayers will always face that brunt of uh, those decisions and so that is part of living in a very international and globalized world so speaking of international trade and geopolitics and things like that one of the sdg 17 targets is to G17.12, it talks about duty-free and quota-free market access for all least developed countries. 
And I wanted to ask you, do you know how that would interact with things like market sanctions, like we've seen with Russia recently? Like, does that mean, how do you balance wanting to support the actual people who are living in an undeveloped country with also wanting to be able to place sanctions and restrictions on unethical governments? It does want to address that. In terms of what countries can do, I think uh, is going to be interesting to see and find out. But I think that, you know, at the end of the day, what countries intend to do is to ensure the quality of life is decent for individuals in other countries. You know, they're respecting cultural diversity, revitalizing the economy in those countries, ensuring that the labor market needs are met. And they're bringing in the right set of skills so that they can then be more financially sustainable. It becomes really tricky because when you see people struggling and you you can help them, you want to help them. You know, you have empathy. Like, I don't want to be people and stuff, for example. But it's complicated because you can't just, you know, go, oh, well, I'll send you food. Because it is definitely challenging, I think, to make sure that the right people are, are getting supported. And I think, you know, uh, the SDGs in its nature, because they're so broad and diverse in terms of targets, it's challenging to achieve because it's a very ambitious roadmap. But I think, you know, again, they've built it with the right intention and with the right set of principles. And I think it's really going to be interesting to see how it lays out. By 2030, we we need to see how different countries are faring and where they're actually doing well and where they're not. The other challenge is to have countries doing voluntary national reviews. And I think, you know, again, there's a wealth of information there, but unless we all participate, we're not going to know how well we're doing things. I actually have a question relating to the data because it is voluntary. How do you actually compare the different statistics that you might get? Do you run into a problem of things being too different in different contexts to draw a fair comparison? I think they have key indicators. And so I think there's consistency in that. But how well the data is reported in each country based on the infrastructure that they have developed for that is something that people need to sort of take into account. So a country, you know, a low middle income country may or may not have invested in having people to do just that particular job. The Nordic countries who do really well may be collecting data really well because they have an established unit that can influence the information that is presented in a report. The Nordic countries actually are a really great example, I think, of statistical difficulty because there's a paradox where... um, the rate of like sexual assaults or something in in Nordic countries or countries that have really high levels of gender equality is significantly higher than in other places. And it makes you like go, that can't be right. How does that work? And when you look at it, it's because you've got a culture where people feel free to come forward and a culture where they actually record the statistics. And then you'll find in other places they're not recording complaints and a lot of people are afraid to come forward. So it's not actually a fair representation of what's actually happening. Just Exactly. The other uh, issue could also be that, you know, certain countries are so populous compared to others. <clears throat> Getting that data is much more challenging than a, a country with a much smaller well-defined population. And if you're finding most of your population is in rural areas, it's very difficult to know how those communities are implementing the SDGs. Yeah, I completely get that because it is very difficult to have like census and things like that. And I I know, you know, like a a lot of studies will rely on, you know, self-report and all of these other factors that can influence what the actual data looks like and yeah. yeah, and the question is, are we comparing apples to apples? Which, yeah. which we're not. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. So, yeah, it's it's sort of like, how are we doing? Well, it's complicated. <laughs> One other thing I really wanted to ask about, is there a danger of cultural erosion that comes from this uh, sort of globalisation effort? That's an interesting question because you can see both sides, whether certain cultures will get diluted because of globalisation. But on the other hand, we have the opportunity to educate all those globalized individuals about the cultures 
that we are proud to retain. So I'm thinking about indigenous knowledge and how that's incorporated in practically everything that we do here in Canada. Really? So that's, yes. And so that's an opportunity for someone like me who's lived in India and then lived in the UK to learn more about because it's mm. something that I was not exposed to in the UK. So that's something that I'm learning more and more about here. As more and more cultures get integrated, I think it just makes for a richer environment. I think, you know, as people move around the globe, people are just going to go carry on learning more and more. It increases exposure to a particular culture. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I think increased cultural participation is a really great thing when it's like embraced you know, earnestly by, by all parties. I think that that's lovely. And I, I love when that happens. I think that's really great. For me personally, I think that tradition for the sake of tradition isn't necessarily something that you want to like strictly adhere to. For me, I love having the opportunity to sort of like pick and choose which traditions I participate in and go, I really like this one or I don't like that one, so I'm not going to participate in it. I see the world as a matrix. So it's got different coloured squares. It's got, you know, different activities going on. And so... I think that entire mix is exciting and you learn so much and I just end up feeling more and more stimulated to read up and learn more about their culture and interact more with them. So I think it brings you, it brings that perspective, which otherwise, you know, you wouldn't have. And to me, I think that's how the world should be. I do know that places that have that increased multiculturalism, like when people are exposed to people who are other, they don't see them as other, they just see them as people. Yeah, see them as people and as part of the community. And yeah. I think keeping traditions alive, I think it's up to individuals. And I think that knowledge will only carry on if there is someone to actually shine the torch and lead the way. So I think, um, yeah, community organizations, local organizations that people work with, you know, folk fests that people do, all of these are educational opportunities for children to learn. And I think, you know, that way, it's just going to be carried on through generation after generation. That's why there's been such a great shift in media as well towards increased representation. And I think a lot of private companies as well are recognizing the value in diversity, diverse thought. So, you know, because it does bring a lot more to the table when you've got new perspectives. Exactly. And I think the more exposed people are, the more anti-racist people will be. You teach kids from a young age on how to accept people from different cultures and backgrounds and get them to learn different things. And I think, you know, that really shapes an individual's personality as well. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, you know, get involved with people outside of your... Work together on environmentally friendly initiatives. Think about, you know, food wastage, stuff that you eat at home. If you've got leftovers, what you can do. You know, it's actually a meal for a homeless person. So think about that kind of perspective and really work with your local community organizations, increase cultural awareness by participating in cultural events. It could be something like, I don't know, a World Food Festival, which is happening at your doorstep. And you sort of, you know, Going there, even as a participant, sampling different cuisines, learning about how things are, you know, made in different countries, what are their traditional dishes. So there's lots of things that we can do in, you know, move forward the SDGs in our own little individual way. That's the situation that we're in because we're like going, all right, we're causing a lot of suffering, not just to us, but we're also, you know, destroying our environment, biodiversity, which is causing increased suffering to ourselves. So it's like... Obviously, something's going to change here because it's not, it's not. Yeah, we're destroying our own playground at the end of the day. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's like, you know, you've got a house and you're trashing it. It's like, you know, who who is this serving? Is this making you happy? (laughs) Probably not. There's a lot of ways that people can go, all right, we can make changes and change isn't bad. It's not just about, oh, we have to stop using plastic or we have to not use anything. It's, It's more about okay, what can we change about the way we do things? And maybe that will actually be just like a purely positive change all around. And I think, you know, many people think the SDGs is just about the environment. It's not just about the environment. We have that mind shift change to adapt and change our lifestyle to create a better planet for everyone. It's all about a change in the way that we do things and using that applied knowledge in a way 
that can benefit everyone. That's what the SDGs are really about. At a really basic level, it's asking, well, why are we doing things the way we do them? Realistically, it's meant to be to, you know, let people live good lives. If the way we're doing things isn't doing that, then obviously it means that we need to change our approach. All right. Well, I think it was such a great time talking to you today. It's a pleasure. (laughs) Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us.